Hello and welcome to Access Chat, second chat of the year, and we're delighted to be joined today by Tara Moss. Tara is multi-talented, an advocate, author, model. Um, we've been waiting some time for this to come around because you got stuck in Australia. So um, the time zones don't work out terribly well between where we are and where you were. So I'm really glad that you had the patience to wait, and we're really glad to have you join us today. Can you tell us a little bit about um, who you are, uh, what you're doing now, and, and how you came to be in the disability advocacy space, because I, I, I'm a big fan of, of some of the stuff that you're putting out on social media and, and, and the message that you're, you're putting out, but it'd be great for our audience to hear in your own words. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And yes, it has been um, a bit of time in the making because 2020 was such a weird year. So it's a real honor to be on here. Um, I am an author, that is my main job, so I have uh, published 13, a lucky 13 books so far in four different genres. I started out with crime fiction um, and then wrote a, a memoir, a part memoir called The Fictional Woman, which was really about um, social advocacy issues and the experiences of women and girls. Um, and followed that up with Speaking Out, which is a kind of uh, manual for activists and people wanting to get involved in, um, in, in public advocacy work. Uh, and wrote a paranormal series. And my latest is The War Widow, which is a historical fiction book. Um, so most of my days are spent like here at home writing. Um, uh, I did spend quite a while uh, modeling. I was very fortunate to be able to travel the world and uh, do that for a living, as strange as that industry is. And um, there are certainly some downsides there. If, if you read my work, you'll, you'll know I haven't been shy about the downsides of the modeling industry, but it was um, a real privilege for me to be able to travel and uh, experience new cultures and, and people from a young age. I'm also a documentary host and uh, sometime producer as well. So I have done a, a production on cyber hate for Australia's ABC. Um, I've just finished a criminal investigation in Australia, which will be coming out um, later this year. Uh, so I'm still very much involved in, in other types of productions as well. I've done shows for Nat Geo and Crime and Investigation Network. Um, and I have been very much involved in uh, human rights advocacy and uh, advocacy for women and girls through, um, through UNICEF and through my own independent work for, for many years. Um, and about five, gosh, I can't believe it, five years ago now, um, I was injured um, and that led to a disability. So that has given me, I guess, uh, more perspective on disability than what I had before. And uh, in time, I've tried to use my platforms that I have through the work I've been doing over the last couple of decades to be able to um, bring more visibility to disability and just to speak openly about some of the issues faced by people with disabilities. We are, you know, we are many and, and varied, of course. So everybody's experiences are very different, but what I try to do um, using the skills I have is to kind of present and be visible as a person who uses mobility aids in, in particular, um, and someone who maybe doesn't look like the uh, stereotypical idea of someone who is either disabled or uses mobility aids. So trying to break down some barriers and stigma there has been uh, part of my, um, my focus the last few years. And I think that's probably how we've connected online, Neil. Yeah, ab absolutely. So I, I, mean, I, I spend an awful lot of time on, on social media, particularly Twitter, as do uh, Deborah and Antonio. Um, and yeah, I came across your tweets and, and started engaging. I really liked, and, and now, of course, you have seen your Instagram too, and you're posting stuff. I, I, you know, I, I really liked the sort of positive vibe, the, uh, the, 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 like you, you described, the, the wanting to challenge the, the stereotypical uh, view, which is quite plainly wrong, of, of how disabled people look and live and everything else. So I, and I think that th that, that for me was, was something that chimed. Um, you know, a lot of people have hidden disabilities. A lot of people acquire disabilities. You, 
you, you clearly got a, a very full career and all of the rest of it. And I think that that is really important for giving people, resetting their expectations about us, our communities, our abilities. Um, and I think that, that that was one of the reasons why I, I, I wanted to to have you on, but you also talk a lot about body image and 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 the perception of and other people's perceptions, and I think that those are areas that that are, are constant themes that we talk about over the years on on our chats uh, and with our community because representation uh, of of disability tends to be either too negative or inspiration porn, and, and I think that that you hit a sweet spot for me in that you're you're living your life you're doing all of your good stuff and you're doing that and then disability is just part of life and it's a natural part of life it's not an addendum um and, and that that is where we would like i think to see more of this in in the media so how how have you found that you know working in in the public eye the the reaction to you becoming more uh, open about your disability and your use of mobility aids well, look, I have to say I was very anxious initially about um, being seen as someone who, you know, wasn't going to recover, you know, that, that, that sort of narrative about recovery mm -hmm. was very strong initially. It was also the expectation. Uh, and when it, the, when it was clear that I had uh, CRPS, so I have a pain condition called CRPS, and that um, the prognosis was not, you know, it wasn't likely to just kind of go away. I wasn't going to be returning to normal, you know, uh, to my previous normal. Um, I had to really do a bit of a, a reset. And I know that part of that involved being anxious about, you know, the how people were going to receive this change. It wasn't so much my being anxious about my reality because it was already my reality. Like I was already living it every day. It was more, you know, can I deal with what um, I have to adapt to right now because it's new and I have to find new ways to deal with this in my daily life and also deal with public perception right now. Like, can I take that extra load right now? And so I was anxious about that. Um, my experience has been that um, reaching out and being open about my disability has been extremely uh, rewarding and important personally for me. I understand that's not necessarily the case for everyone. They have to decide for themselves whether they um, you know, wanna talk openly about uh, their physical condition and their disability. But for me, it was extremely positive and I remember um, Tara and Wolfie is an Instagram uh, page that I've set up specifically focused on uh, disability and chronic illness um, and mobility aids and kind of the visibility around that. And when I started, um, I guess, expressing myself through Tara and Wolfie, I was finding a <clears throat> lot of other people in a similar situation and people I could relate to. And that just, you know, I guess, we don't always walk down the street and find other people that we can relate to in that way. You go online and suddenly there's this incredible community. And that was something I guess I didn't expect um, to be as powerful as it's been. So, so my, the lesson for me has really been that the anxiety I felt about being open really um, was a bit over, uh, overwrought and that actually had I uh, reached out earlier to the community, maybe that would have been a, a, a better process for me in, in some ways. Um, in terms of the media reaction, yeah, it's, you know, uh, you, can't, you can't control how people are going to perceive you. So I've had all the types of reactions that um, a lot of people with invisible disabilities are familiar with. The, you know, the idea that like, you know, you can't be disabled because I don't know, you're, you're leaving the house or you dress well, or I, I saw you walk to your car and then get your wheelchair out. Like th this idea that there aren't ambulatory wheelchair users or that um, disabilities are static uh, or easily seen. Those types of misconceptions are really still very much in the community and a real problem. So doing that in the public eye just kind of 
you know, makes that bigger, I suppose. <laughs> um, so it's been a mixed bag, but overall I would say that being really open has been rewarding and important for me and, and something that I, um, I've i really uh, valued very much, just being able to be myself and not hide. You know, Terry, you, I, um, I, I'm really looking forward to reading your work. I'm really looking forward to, especially the paranormal one. I, I love books yeah. that address that and I love historical stuff. So, but I, I, you bring up a really important point because um, m for example, my daughter was born with Down syndrome and uh, trisomy 21 as she, she always tells me, but um, there is inside the disability community, all this infighting. It's like, well, are you disabled enough? Yeah, but you're not, yours is are invisible or, and people stopping, I have um, so many of my friends, including mutual friends uh, uh, that uh, Caroline Casey, Dr. Caroline Casey is a mutual friend of uh, Neil Antonio and myself. And she has people come up to her all the time, even though she's legally blind and she uses a cane. Um, and tell her she doesn't look disabled. And, and it's, it's, and I remember a couple of times when there were some programs when my daughter went, were, were, was in school that would help enrich her and she wouldn't make the cut. And so it's like, it's, a, it's, it, they, these are really major social issues because it's like, well, Tara, you can't be disabled. You're too pretty. You're too, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a really important thing. And I've had people say, well, uh, as I first moved into this industry in 2000, um, well, we don't want to hear from the parents. We don't want to hear from the parents. And it's like, but wait a minute, I'm part of the community. Don't, don't you want to welcome people to the community? And then of course, if you were born with a disability like my daughter, which is an obvious disability, as opposed to sadly my husband who has a very much more significant disability now than my daughter. He sadly is in late stage dementia due to a traumatic brain injury when he was hit by a car as a child. Um, and I, there's, it's almost like our dirty little secret in the disability community of how we end fight with each other. You know, no, the blind are more important than the deaf are more important than the, well, we don't want to be part of your community. We see that all over the world. And I think that's why it's so important for women like you to step up and join the conversations. And I also really, really applaud as a fellow woman that you're focusing on girls and women and really helping empower that as well, because the intersectionality of disabilities, we often also are not talking to, uh, talking about. And, and, and the body image issues. I, on my other show, which I'm, I'm hoping you all come on Human Potential at Work, but I was discussing with another woman, we were really talking about body images and throwing around a word that I have come to dislike, uh, an N word called normal, because okay. I just don't know what that means. And I feel pretty confident I'm not normal. I mean, who has purple hair? Well, I do, <laughs> too bad. I like it, I'm 60. Why can't I have whatever color hair I want to? So it's like, and that's such a little nuanced thing, but it's how do we allow people to be truly who they are and applaud every bit of who they are? My husband is not less of a human because he now has very serious dementia. He's not. And it's, it's interesting watching how people treat him and don't think he doesn't notice it. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to applaud so much your work. And I know it's not always easy. It's not easy. You've talked about that. But why did you decide it was important to step up and really own who you are? Because not everybody's doing that. Not everybody knows to do that. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Um, look, at. I touched on this before. I know that it is a privilege to be in a position where you can um, you can say you're disabled and still feel that you can put food on the table. You know, like, like I do know that that's an issue and um, I won't mince words here. I've lost a, a lot of income and work, you know? So that's, that's real. 
Okay. Um, but I feel like um, I'm in a fortunate enough position that I can be myself, I can uh, present myself a, in a, an honest and forthright way and, and continue to do the work that I love being an author. I can, you know, write from home, do this work. I'm my own boss in many ways, right? So I'm, I know that that's a privilege. But um, it became important to me, especially as someone who has a history in the human rights um, sphere, being an advocate in that way, what kind of an advocate would I be if I thought, well, this is, you know, this is something I need to cover up. It, it, it sort of puts um, shame, um, shame around this aspect of my life, right? And I know that we, inter we can internalize that and feel this kind of, um, sense of shame, like this is the part of me I don't want to share because it's bad or it's, um, it indicates failure or it's uh, a shameful or embarrassing in some way. So again, having given that caveat that I understand that it's a privilege to be in the position to, to be open about this, I will say that being able to be open has been empowering for me um, and it has helped me to connect with other people who have, um, chronic pain, who have disability, and who can actually guide me when I have questions, who can help to make my life more um, functional and positive in really concrete and real ways. And I wouldn't have that if I had remained kind of, you know, hi hiding my mobility aids behind people's backs when the camera came out. Because i that's what I did the first time. And I realized I'd done that and thought, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that again. I, you know, I was using a cane initially, and um, I was doing an event, and the event was about my writing and so on. And when we did photos at the end, I put the cane behind someone, and so it wasn't in photos. Part of my mindset at that time was that this is temporary. I don't want the media to make a big deal of it. I'm not willing to take questions about this right now and be have it be a focus. So I just wanted to kind of have it be invisible. But then I also realized that there was something else going on there, which was maybe a little bit of internalized ableism. So I worked through that and fought it. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's a process for everyone to decide how they how they need to live, but um, and they need to make those decisions for themselves. But for me, really, if I had continued to kind of hide, I think that I just would not have anywhere near the same support that I have now, and I probably would be. I wouldn't be as far along the track in terms of providing myself with the things I need to, to have less pain, to be more mobile and, and independent. I'd probably be still spending a lot of time in bed um, on bad pain days rather than getting in my wheelchair. I wouldn't have one. You know, I'd feel like oh, I don't, you know, I'm not disabled enough or I don't qualify or, you know, I, I just wouldn't understand that that's what they're for. You know, that's why people, you know, that's why they were made. It is when people, they're tools. Yeah, they're yeah. tools. You know, they're, they're tools. tools. They're, they're a, they are aids for living and for independence. They are, you know, this is an object of freedom that I'm sitting in right now. It's for freedom. It is not uh, a sign of you know, failure or you're not, not broken hard enough or, you know. Yeah. You're not confined to it. It's it's yeah. enabling you to go places. You know, it's, it's enabling it. you to not be com confined to bed to to being you know on a bad pain day. So yeah, exactly. It's a it's a positive thing rather than what it's perceived to be by many people as as being pretty negative. So I think Antonia, you had a question, didn't you? No, my question goes uh, exactly on, on on that direction. So Tara, where do you want to go now? Where do I want to go now? Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think any of us can do that right now, but I, um, I, I just want to keep learning and growing. Um, I'm on my own, you know, journey, if you will, regarding, you know, managing my pain and my complex regional pain syndrome. And that's an ongoing daily um, process. In terms of advocacy, you know, I just want to be able to, to be myself and be out there. And I am, you know, I guess in some ways really, well, very much heartened by the messages I've been getting mostly privately from people saying, you know, my daughter or myself, I, I'm using mobility aid now because I could see you using one and it reduced the 
the obstacles, the mental obstacles they had around it. Um, they felt that it was too taboo or embarrassing and the stigma was holding them back. And we do know that from studies that that is really common. You know, a huge number of people would benefit from mobility aids for various reasons because of pain, dizziness, um, you know, all of these different issues that might be um, yeah. dealing with in their day-to-day -day life and um, stigma is holding them back or stopping their health professionals from even suggesting these options to them. So making it visible is really helpful and I wanna to continue to do that. Um, and just to, just to learn and to grow uh, and do what I can and um, I guess shine a light on other people's work in the disability um, sphere because there's so many important advocates and so many different areas to discuss. Um, and yeah, I guess just continuing to be out there and, uh, and be myself uh, which is, uh, yeah, a, a joy and a privilege to be able to do. Uh, lots of books, right? Lots of books. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, we, from time to time, we, we receive messages from people who say, oh, I really like, you know, I, I follow the conversations that you are having, but I never share it, uh, any of your tweets. I never share any of your content. I never like it because... I'm afraid that if I do that, it will point out that uh, I'm, I have something, I might have a disability and I don't want my employer or someone to know. So that stigma is still very uh, present. And I think it, it's, it's important for us to, to highlight it. Uh, and so I think your, uh, your words were particularly important uh, on, on that because people shouldn't be holding them. We need to understand where they are, okay? We need to, to, to understand that, that people might be afraid and they don't feel that confident. It's not, and it's not up to us to tell them what they should do or not. But I, I think it's important for us to change society to make, sure, to make their life easier in, in the long term. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. It, it's... Um... You know, now that I am using a wheelchair on and off, because it's been a, a process over the last five years, you know, I was aware of accessibility problems before. Um, I think I even in my human rights work have, have focused on it from time to time. Now that I'm experiencing it myself, you know, wow, it's, there are a, a lot of obstacles out there and things that should be changed. Um, and having voices out there normalizing mobility aids, uh, normalizing the you know, I think it's about a quarter of the people in the world who have a form of disability. You know, just being open and, and, and acknowledging that this is a um, this is a normal part of human experience. It always has been. It's not something to be othered or shamed. It's 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 life, and um, you know, we we are we are all here together with our different bodies and experiences and our different. Um, you know, ways of being and, uh, and that needs to be accepted and acknowledged. Uh, and I, I think that there's a long way to go in that regard. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. You know, we, we still have a road to travel. Um, you talked about chronic regional pain syndrome and, and one of the taboos around pain is around um, medication and <laughs> particularly uh, opiates and opioids and and, and and pain relief and over the last number of years there's been almost like a crusade against opioid medicine and we had um, Kate Nicholson on who is a, a, a lawyer and a pain advocate and, and Kate was a very um, clear advocate for the reasons why actually medication enabled her to live you know because uh, so have you have you found that 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 experience too do you know the that people take a dim view of, of the thing that actually enables you to live a more quote-unquote normal life and 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 how do you then sort of deal with sort of going against the sort of flow of public opinion on this because because people have suddenly gone oh pain relief bad pain medicine bad and, and and actually abuse of pain medicine bad pain medication in itself a good thing generally yes look i think that it's there's a lot of stigma around there's, there's so much ableism out there 
And that manifests in many ways. And one of the ways it manifests is this idea that you can't somehow unthink your pain. Like, you know, I've got uh, a pain condition that's considered to be, you know, one of the very severe ones, you know, it, 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 it can be very severely painful. The idea that I'm supposed to just kind of unthink that and not need any um, medical support for it, no medication is, is ludicrous. Um, so I, I am quite open about the fact that I take medication to help with my functioning and my quality of life. And, you know, I love my life. I love my life. I love my body. I don't want to be in horrific pain. Um, nobody does or should be, and we should use the tools that are available to us. Um, I was also very open about, for example, uh, ketamine infusions, which in my particular case with CRPS, has proven to be one of the more effective methods for pain management, but it's really invasive. I have to spend a whole week in hospital on a sub anesthetic infusion in a, a room with tubes out of my arm. Do I want to do that? Would I rather just eat kale and take my vitamins and have that, you know, work? Well, of course, um, uh, you know, but yoga is not going to do that. It's not going to do what this particular treatment which is designed to you know, suppress this um, pain response. It's not gonna do what ketamine can do, particularly for my condition. And it's, it's not gonna be appropriate for everyone, but the fact that there's this taboo around even having a procedure which reduces pain is I think really appalling. Um, it's again, a kind of, you know, don't cry, don't show emotion, don't, cry, don't uh, show that you feel pain. Don't show that you are disabled or there's something you can't do. It's like a, some kind of a sign of vulnerability. Well, guess what? I'm bloody strong. I'm one of the strongest people I know. And so are the other people in the disability and chronic illness communities. They're absolute rock stars as far as I'm concerned. And the fact that they are managing this stuff only brings them higher in my eyes. So yeah, re reducing this idea that somehow everything can be managed with just positive thinking, you know, just a smoothie. You know, I'm not saying positive thinking doesn't help. It does, it's great. Yeah. Positive thinking is, yeah, is marvelous. Um, stretching yeah. and yoga are marvelous exercises. It's important, all those things. But, you know, there are medical conditions out there. There are pain conditions and actually leaving them uh, without treatment is detrimental to that person and their body. Yeah. So this is not something we should encourage people just, you know, dump things that are going to help them. That, that's but, not but that opinion on pain relief and, and, and the sort of crusade against opioids has actually had a really detrimental effect on, on the community because it's made it much harder for people, particularly in North America, to then be able to get access to the medication that they rightfully need to be able to live you know, the fulfilling life that you're describing. That's right. And in Australia as well, um, while I was um, over there uh, last year, you know, I, this is a lot of the conversation that was happening was that the crackdown on opioid uh, prescriptions meant that a lot of people, you know, particularly people who have invisible conditions like pain conditions, you could just have a doctor who says, well, you know, you're just going to have to not have this medication anymore. Why don't you try positive thinking and send you home or why don't you try some over-the-counter Advil or something? And it's like, it's not going to work. You're leaving that person with um, pain they should, at a level that they shouldn't have to try to manage. And it actually is very negative on the body and the central nervous system. So it causes the problems to, to get worse. So there's, yeah, we want to make sure people are taking medicine as safely as possible. You know, I'm, I'm not going to ignore the fact that there are people out there who are um, who are suffering as a result of over medication or over prescription or not being given other tools but taking the medication away from them is not the answer that people need support they need pain relief and they need that on so many different levels including just if you if you if you want to make the argument just about the health of their body yeah they need pain uh, relief that's really important for them physically as well as mentally and emotionally. And to have them be believed as well. Person comes right. in, they, you know, a person comes and says, I'm in pain, I can't cope. This is, I've got 10 out of 10 pain. 
you know, you need to be listening to that, that person and recognizing you can't see it. Uh, you know, it's not right. a, a visible thing. And, and assuming that you're lying about it, it, it just is, it, it just, there's so many things wrong with that. Why? And, and we have medical science, medical science that, that, you know, human beings have come up with. Why don't we use the medical science and the tools and stop assuming that people are broken. It, it, we're, people are broken because society breaks us by mm. putting all these ridiculous conditions on us. And I remember when my daughter was born with Down syndrome, she got a low, um, I think it's called APGAR score, where they decide, and, and she got a six, which is sort of unusual. And, but she wasn't diagnosed for four months. And when they diagnosed her with Down syndrome, I, um, I, I, I'm not accepting it. I'm not telling anybody. I'm not. Uh, and because society keeps telling us, oh, and, and your daughter's broken. And then even when people would learn about it, instead of being excited that I had this precious, amazing baby girl, they didn't even want to talk to me because they didn't know what to say. So it, and we're seeing a lot of that right now, I think, with COVID-19. You know, people, those the sheer losses, I mean, certainly here in the States. I mean, and I, I just, I, I think that we have to stop defining what it means to be human. And that's why I think people like you, Tara, the, the work that, you know, that we're all doing, um, it is critical that we continue to say, stop it. Medical science has a lot to offer us and mm -hmm. yoga and spiritual thinking, light. Mind. I do all that stuff, yes. but I actually, during these dark times of COVID, it's, you know, not just COVID, the pandemic, all the political horror that's happening in the United States, the violence. Um, I'm actually struggling as an optimist, trying to not be so optimistic and light it's fascinating because there's a balance with all that as well. But as you noted, a quarter of human beings have disabilities because we're in these beautiful, precious biological bodies. So it's it's just and such a shame that you know body, bodies right. are not static. Um, and disabilities are not static. Uh, no. I think those are the things that I've found so so fascinating that there's a misconception around you know how you're disabled one day and then the next day somehow you're not because they saw you walk to your car or I don't know you 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 switch the side you're using your cane on so you know, and, you go, and you're like what's because I had a handbag and I need like why do you even and also what is going through your mind looking at that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah like right. why there's so, so many things wrong with it. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's almost like, no, oh, you are trying to have a life. Oh, I'm yeah. sure you can't be disabled. You are trying to have a life, so you can't be, no? That's right. <laughs> or um, I think someone else mentioned, you know, they took away some disability parking, I think, because they were using, um, you know, expanding the cafes out because of COVID, right? So the, the disability parking was taken away. And some people argued, well, they don't need that because they've got to stay at home because of COVID. It's like, wow. But actually, disabled people have lives and, you know, they, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just extraordinary to me or this idea like well you can't use uh if they're disabled they don't really need disabled parking like i just i just wow. i don't understand how they can people can go through life not realizing that like a quarter of the people they see have a disability of some sort like how can you think it's so such a separate universe um it's really you know i know that popular culture uh and media have not helped with this in, in many respects as a storyteller uh, that is an area that it, I focus on, of course, because uh, I see it all the time in film and just go like, wow, the messages we put out there ha have been really um, confusing and, and inaccurate and have created myths. Um, and that's another reason why I'm so passionate about making sure people with disabilities are able to tell their stories, be visible and be heard, because, you know, it's really enough of other people telling our stories and getting it terribly wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so 
how do you integrate that into your into your storytelling? Do you have any sort of sort of uh, favorite character that, uh, or and and how one of the other things that we, we were talking with a chap called Kurt Yeager, who's a, an actor, and he was like, "Well, I don't want to be the disabled actor. I don't want to be playing the disabled roles. I want to be doing the normal roles." How do you sort of weave the disability in because as you say it's part of normal life into the the character creation as you write your fiction it's a good question um in the war widow it's historical fiction as i mentioned and it's set in 1946 you know immediately post-war of course there's mm -hmm. a, a rise in, in disability uh, because of uh, the conflict um that had taken place for years and years so it is natural to not only include disability, but to kind of describe the, the changes in the communities. Um, it's set in Sydney, and at that time, there were a lot of uh, people, nurses as well, who'd returned from, um, from their work, but a lot of returned soldiers who had visible uh, disabilities or scarring from injuries. And, you know, there was um, this phenomenon where a lot of these men went off into the Australian bush to live in solitude because of the, um, the shame they felt um, or made to feel with people pointing at them in the street and, and not accepting the, the visible changes that, that, that were there. So I think just mentioning some of that history, weaving the history in, it's a way of representing real life and fiction more fully um, you know, I can't pretend to do it perfectly, but that is my aim. It, I don't actually need to make stuff up in a lot of cases. No. All I need to do is include it to okay. actually acknowledge, you know, the, there's a lift operator, for example, in uh, The War Widow, who's a return vet. And, you know, he is an amputee and he was working the, the lifts, the elevators. And that was something that was very common at that time. It was a role for a lot of the return soldiers. And Billy Walker has a secretary or assistant who is a returned war vet and he has missing fingers on one hand and has been booted by the army because he's no longer, you know, able-bodied. Um, and that was a common experience. So it's, it's not even necessary for me to kind of stretch myself to think, you know, how do I include this? It's just um, actually seeing it and going, yeah, this is part of the story. Um, this is part of life at that time. And it makes the the work more authentic um, yeah. and, and much more interesting as yeah. far as I'm concerned. So there's yeah, there's wonderful characters um, in the War Widow that that have disabilities or just are you know just visible and 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 part of that history, that real history. Thank you, and and, and that's exactly what we need more of, which is that that sort of representation of reality because we're there already and what happens in the media is that we disappear That's so uh it's been a real pleasure talking with you mm -hmm. we've reached the end of our time we need to thank the people that keep us on air and support us so barclays access microlink and and my clear text for making sure that we're captioned uh and we really look forward to you, you joining us on twitter next week thank, thank you, you very much tara. thank you tara Thanks, Commander Santos. Thank you, Neil. <laughs>